I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Martha Rice from the Brantford Land Trust and Jane Booley is the town historian. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Land Trust and the First Congregational Church of Brantford. This is the third year that we have offered a set of walks and events to allow the public to come out and enjoy this special place. English colonists came and settled Brantford in 1644. There had already been 20 years of uh, English and Dutch and native interaction. Uh, and the people of Brantford, this was called Town Neck, this peninsula, and then Town Neck Meadow was the creek and the meadow between here and Johnson's Point, which we'll see at the end of our walk. Um, and Short Beach was not called that. Kilms Point was never part of Short Beach, but to our west was, is Short Beach. Uh, and that was not called Short Beach until after the Civil War. It was called Scotch Cap. And I haven't figured out what is the Scotch Cap. Is it a rock that looked like a Scotch Cap? I never have figured that out. Uh, but uh, Short Beach was the last shoreline community to be settled in 1640 because there was no access. This area here, which we call Granite Bay, was marsh and was wetlands. It was still somewhat wet when I was a kid. That was all been filled in and the road built. The bridge going over the Farm River by the old Nellie Greens, which some of you may remember, wasn't built until after the Civil War. So the only way to get down here was down Alps Road. And that was much higher and rockier and more difficult. It was called the Alps because it's sort of Branford's mountain, you know. <laughs> and it was more mountainous, mountainous back then. So there, it was hard access. However, the colonists did use this area for obviously fishing, uh, for gathering salt hay, which was a very important crop for them for fertilization. So again, Short Beach is different than Kilms Point, and we're going to talk about Kilms Point today. Uh, I just want to point out <clears throat> a few places here. So you've come on to Kilms Point. This is what we call the north part of the point. This was the area where um, Henry Kilms and his family came and built homes. The building behind us is a bowling alley, or was a bowling alley, one of the first bowling alleys in the state. And this tennis court was one of the first clay tennis courts in the state. And this is, uh, Henry Killams would have his family and guests come and play tennis and bowl. They had a large stable over here, this gray barn. The horses were put out to the meadow, the salt meadow, uh, for grazing. The house behind you, the little cottage, was the first house built on the point, it's the caretaker's house. The bowling alley, based on my research, is only one of two still uh, 19th century bowling alleys, buildings that still exist in the state of Connecticut. Um, I'm going to pass along a couple photos for you to uh, a look at. The first one is what the entrance to Killam's Point used to look like. There was a gate after the road was uh, built and filled in, and then I have a oh, circa 1900 photograph of the bowling alley and uh, a woman playing, two women playing tennis in their long skirts and the shoes, you know, what women had to go through. Uh, and then also, this is a good time to also show you a picture of what Martha was speaking of, which was the, the cow barn behind us and what it looked like around 1920 or so. So I'll just start that and, and you know you can take these for the whole trip so eventually everybody sees them. I just want to point out a couple of things from this viewpoint. Make your, make your way down this way so everybody can see. The island in the center of this little bay is owned by the Killams family. There are still Killam descendants that live on Killams Point. And the island uh, further out is owned by the Brantford Land Trust. It was donated to the Land Trust um, by the Killams family. Green Island. Green Island. What's up? No. Uh, to the right. We call it Poison Ivy Island. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Or Turn. Turn Island. 
The other thing, a couple other things I want to point out. Um, I've been fortunate to live on Killam's Point for um, about 43 years. And when we first moved here, the marsh was out along that rock wall that you see. And it's uh, eroded quite a bit since we've been here over the years. And in a normal high tide, the water comes just up t almost to the road here. Uh, it's changed a lot over the years. I also want to point out the Phragmites, which is here. Uh, Phragmites is an invasive plant, although there is a very small native population in the Connecticut River. Um, it mostly grows in an area where uh, the soil has been disturbed. So if you look here where it is, all along the edge and out into the marsh and out that way, Phragmites is this tall plant here. You can see that it, it grew in when the road, the road was put in. Uh, the yellow flowers here are woodland sunflowers and a lot of poison ivy. Poison ivy. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, in case you don't live in Branford, uh, so you're familiar with what you see, is uh, looking across the water all the way to the opposite side is uh, Rockland Park. Uh, and Johnson's Beach, you can not you can see a little bit. The Yale Varsity Sailing Club is right there. And then around the bend, the, right, the red house is Kelsey's Island. It's, it's not connected to land. There's a piece of water in between. And around that is East Haven, the Farm River. <laughs> so that separates Short Beach and Branford from East Haven. So that's the, your bearings as you're looking at this view. Pretty nice, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so this is a spot known as Love's Beach, and I think Jane's going to tell you why that is. Um, this beach is mainly for the members of the Congregational Church. They come out all summer and use this spot. Um, again, it looks over to the Yale Sailing School and to Rockland Park, as Jane mentioned. Okay. Yeah, this uh, Yale University Varsity Sailing, yes. They've been there for uh, 30 or 35 years now. Uh, it's here that I'd like to just uh, remind you that the native people were here, the Europeans were the newcomers. And so when, uh, when Branford was settled in 1644, again, the native people had already had interaction with Europeans, first the Dutch, maybe even the Vikings, we don't know, you know that for sure, uh, and then the English. And so their numbers, which probably um, numbered about 10,000 individuals in Connecticut uh, before the English came, was quite a bit decimated by the 1640s by disease, mostly. Measles and smallpox, they had no immunity to them whatsoever. They'd never been exposed to it. Uh, so in Branford, there were probably only a couple thousand uh, native people in New Haven Colony by the time Branford was settled, and perhaps 100 to 150 individuals in Branford. Again, the English did not pay particular attention to the, na I'll say Indians, because that's what they called them. Um, they had a lot, it, not just that they didn't pay any attention to them, they were very busy. They, were, they weren't social historians put, put in Connecticut to record what the Indians were doing. They were very busy building their houses and surviving and dealing with their crops. But the uh, Indians are mentioned in quite a number of town records and county records, uh, deeds in particular, and in court records. And so they're uh, we have an accounting of about 24 male Indians that are recorded in Branford deeds over about a 110 year period. So if they had families over the space of 100 years, uh, the late John Menta did really the seminal work on Quinnipiac Indians um, that is published, and I'll hand, hand that out to you um, so you can get the title. It's well worth reading. He did really a lot of research, and it's his estimation between 100 and 200 individuals that were here in Branford when the colonists came. Uh, and I think so one of the things I, I always thought or was taught or learned somehow is the uh, Indians lived in Branford in the summer and then they net went north in the winter like to Kent, Connecticut and they did that and yeah to hunt. 
Well, that always, as I did more research, that sort of didn't make much sense to me. Why would you go north to Kent, Connecticut in the winter where it's 25 degrees colder when you have this? 20 degrees cooler, an abundance of mammals, both large and small. Uh, birds that we don't have any so much anymore, like quail and partridge, uh, clams of all kinds, mussels of all kinds, sm small rodents, the list goes on and on, nuts and berries, as much wood as you could possibly have. And so that's the more recent research would indicate that that is they actually were farmers. They had homesteads here, such as it is. Now, John Mentis said they did travel there was an extensive network of traveling between tribes all over New England, New York. A lot of the arrowheads that were found in Brantford through the years are from New York. So there was an extensive trails and trading mechanisms between the native people. There were about 12 small tribes of native people in Connecticut when the colonists came. The ones here in Brantford were called Totuckets by the settlers, the English settlers of Brantford. And the Totokets were part of the greater uh, tribe of the Quinnipiacs. Uh, and then the Quinnipiacs were part of the Mat Matabesic Indians of Middletown. And so that was kind of the group that was here. All of the New England tribes spoke Algonquin. You've heard of that, that term, Algonquin. That was the language. That was not a tribe, but the language that they spoke together. And so the Quinnipiac group, again, it was the larger New Haven area. Uh, the sachem, sachems of the Quinnipiacs were Mamaguin, sound familiar, and Montawis. Uh, and they were closely associated by, by blood to different people. For example, the sachem of Guilford, which is the Menonukuk Indians, was a female called Shampashu, and her uncle was Montawis. So they were interrelated by family and by blood. Um, they probably were here at least 8,000 years before the English came. So they were established and so on. I mentioned that they were farmers. The colonists, a lot of the colonists that came to Connecticut in particular were middle class. They lived in cities. They were not farmers and they certainly were not Paul Bunyans. These people did not have a clue how to cut down a tree. And why they decided, uh, some of it, they, they were conned into coming here in some cases. There was a lot of propaganda in England about that this was a paradise. And in some ways it was because England was out of wood. And so you came to this, for them it was a paradise to have all this wood. But they didn't tell them about the winners <laughs> and they didn't tell them about the bears and all these other things. So, I, you know, the native people certainly had to teach them how to cut a tree, how to plant crops in this environment. Again, I wonder why did they want to plant crops in Short Beach? It is rocks, people. <laughs> but root, ve root vegetables did very well here. Um, and you can see that the native people would have been here to gather in what they needed in this beautiful place, uh, the birds and the, the shellfish and so on. Uh, they knew how to fish. They dammed streams to make weirs. You, you're familiar with that term weirs. There's a weir street in Brantford uh, in Indian Neck that's named for that process of damming a stream and making a little dam that the fish could go through, but it would be easier for them to catch. They knew how to salt things for curing. I don't know if you've seen the pictures of how they built the, the salting timbers up high so that the animals couldn't get them. They certainly knew how to do that. And the colonists also used the creek between here and Johnson's Point. That was the town's main salt repository. And it's called so Salt Creek. And that's how the colonists learned how to do it. Of course, there was berries. And they, uh, the Indians, as you all know, traveled by canoe. And the colonists use the Indian trails. There was dozens and dozens of Indian trails all through Connecticut when the colonists came. And most of the roads that the colonists built were not till the 1660s. So for about 25 years, the colonists used canoes. And the Indians taught them how to build the canoes. 
they didn't have time when they came to be building out there building roads to think of the manual labor involved in that and so the colonists eventually widen Indian trails for their own roads Main Street in Branford Monowe Street in Branford Route 135 going up to North Branford Brushy Plain Road all those roads Cherry Hill Road all of those were Indian trails that the colonists then enlarged. Uh, the enlarging of those trails created conflict. The Indians were not very happy about that, were they? Um, so uh, these canoes that the, the colonists had were uh, enough for two to 12 people. They were made out of oak, chestnut, or tulip. We don't have as much tulip as we used to, but it's a pretty hard wood. They would burn, you know, cut it, obviously, burn the pulp, and then scrape it out and they taught the colonists how to do that. Um, let's see what I, uh, and again, I mentioned that the Indians are in some records, and it's, all not, it's not all negative, the interaction between the, the English and the Indians of Branford. It was a small group of people. Uh, so for example, in 1646, the town of Branford uh, made a ruling that no colonists could use an Indian's canoe without their permission. <laughs> which must have been happening you know so uh, so th there is there's some things back and forth it was a little bit later that there started to be more conflict matter of fact the native people fought on the side of the English in the King Philip's war uh, which further decimated their population because some of them died in war um, it was not till a little bit later that there started to be conflict in Connecticut between Indian people and the native people uh, some of it was out of fear. Uh, Anthony Howd of Branford uh, was killed by an Indian in the meadows down by Monowe Street and they never caught who did it. They tried to blame it on a Branford Indian and they couldn't prove it and that we, they don't really think it was him. So, um, And then to tell you a little bit about the presence of the Killen family here. In Branford, the town bought land from the Indians directly. There was never a, an English charter and anything like that. There are deeds in the town records of these various Indians selling their land to the, to the colonists. And the Indians were already at Indian Neck, that peninsula past Lenny's that you all uh, know. That is where their primary living quarters were. They had apple orchards. The, the early deeds talk about the Indians' apple orchards. So they were cultivating crops. They weren't, uh, you know, living in teepees and going uh, bareback across the plains. They were here <laughs> farming. You know, what, what we were taught when we were kids with the movies and stuff, right? A bunch of Italian-American actors b pretending they're Indians. You know, it was like... <laughs> um, so, but in a couple cases, Pawson Park being one and here being the other, is the church purchased the land directly from the Indians separate not the town and so it is an a branch what was a branch of the first congregational church which was which established in 1644 the first ecclesiastical society which was like the business branch of the church was was the organization that purchased that land from the indians and so here at killam's point the uh, first ecclesiastical society bought that land and i don't remember martha how many acres the whole peninsula is the but whole thing, it's a little over 50 the okay whole, the, whole the whole thing, thing. Um, and so the church held that land for a long long time till uh, 1868 uh, when they gave a 100 year lease to J Russell of Branford who was a land baron let us say leased it for very inexpensively for 100 years they didn't know how much land would become of value this land wasn't deemed of much value what could you do with it you know it, there was no access etc and he in 1880 subleased it to Henry Killam uh, Henry Killam was a carriage manufacturer in New Haven with a family and someone mentioned well he must have been rich you didn't have to be super rich he wasn't rich like we think of rich today uh, you know, certainly middle income or upper middle income with a carriage factory, but you didn't need a lot of money to build these cottages. There wasn't much to them. There was no utilities, there was no plumbing, uh, and so on. And so the Killam family came in 1880, and Martha's already spoken of some of these buildings that they built. Uh, and they have been the stewards of this property for all those years. Uh, and leaving it alone is the best stewardship, isn't it? 
Uh, and so the Killam, the Killam's daughter married John Murphy, who was the superintendent of the carriage factory. And it's that family that now is here for six generations, living in the houses that we walked by and being stewards of this land. Uh, and then, rather than talk about it later, when the churches, when the lease, the 100-year lease was coming due, I think in, it was 18, uh, 1968, both in Pawson Park and here, the church decided they were going to sell the land. They didn't want to be landlords, you know, that was not what the church was about. Uh, they sold the land to the people whose houses were as on their land. So in Pawson Park and here, the Murphys owned the houses, but they didn't own the land. So the church offered the land to the people whose houses were on it. And for the most part, both in Pawson Park and here, they purchased the land. It was relatively modest in price. The church didn't know how much value, of course, that land would become in 50 years. And so that's how the Killams then now own the land that we just walked through. The very end of Killams Point, which is called Shepherd's Point, and uh, Harvey, Harvey, Harvey Shepherd was one of the foremen at the carriage factory and Henry Killam sent him out here to scope out some property for the summer and it's Henry uh, uh, Harvey Shepherd that that decided this was a wonderful piece of property and so the Shepherds built their houses at the very end unfortunately for the Shepherds when the first ecclesiastical society sold in 1968 they decided to keep the end mm -hmm. and so the Shepherd family could remove the houses that they owned or leave them and they chose to leave them. All right, any, any questions about uh, some of that? Any? Oh yes, okay. Uh, this is called Love Beach. It's not Lover's Beach or any, <laughs> oh, no, and, and Green Island was Love Island. Well, um, if I get it right, John Murphy's wife's, John, John Murphy's mother-in-law's last name was Love and she was from Hartford. Both her father and grandfather were ministers. Um, and so they were down here. And that's why it's called love for a name rather than some romantic notion. <laughs> uh, they may have had romance, I don't know. But, um, and then there was the love cottage was right, right in here where we are now. And then Martha's told me, I've heard the story before, that uh, Mrs., Mrs. Love uh, didn't like it here. It was very dark and the cottage was very dark. So they moved the cottage across the bay and the house still stands next to the, what is, was the old Short Beach School and it got stuck in the mud going over. Uh, so the Love Cottage ended up in, uh, ended up in Short Beach. They physically, moved the whole they physically moved. It was easy to move houses. They put it on a barge, like a homemade barge. There was no utilities to disconnect, no telephone wires, no electrical poles, and, and off it went. As you face the former Old Short Beach School, it's on the right. Um, I have here, I'll mention also here, I, thought, I was hoping we'd have a few children, uh, but again, where, what, what kind of homes did the Native people have? Um, and again, kids will say, well, they lived in teepees. That's what I thought when I was a kid, didn't you? Well, they did not. They lived, if you've been to the Pequot Museum and so on, they lived in longhouses or wigwams. And again, so easy to build. They used all the natural material that were here, and these could vary in size. They held up during storms and so on. So I'll just pass uh, these uh, illustrations of both a, a canoe and a, a wigwam. Um, so I apologize for bouncing around, and I was going to mention just what uh, Peggy just mentioned. I forgot to tell you a little more about the church. So the church. Um, will allow nonprofit groups to rent out the conference center, which we're going to see in just a minute. Um, it mostly just for day retreats, but also the church runs about uh, four or five weeks of camps, week long camps all summer that are open to the public. And they do all kinds of fun things like crafts and games and swim and just, are able to enjoy this area. Um, and again, the land trust and the church will continue to hold walks um, out here for as many coming years as we can to allow people to come out and enjoy this special place. And the Point House, the ones that um, Jane was referring to that were built by um, Mr. Shepherd and his family and then came to the uh, 
to the church. And this, this house on the left is the one that's the conference center and that's open to nonprofit groups for um, day retreats and use. I'm gonna, I'll talk a little bit about okay, this yeah. in a minute. Um, just again, before I, uh, again, here's our bearings. We're looking across to uh, Shore Drive, Ro Johnson Beach, straight ahead, uh, Rockland Park, and then again, you can see the Kelsey Island, the Kelsey Island, and then the gut, which is what it always was called, even the deeds 150 years ago, separates the mainland and Kelsey's Island. And then around the bend is the Farm River and those glorious condos in East Haven. <laughs> uh, but we have our own, don't we? <laughs> Um, I'd like to uh, just talk a little bit more about the native people, and I've alluded to that they were farmers. They, they grew crops of various kinds. Uh, root vegetables did very well in Shore Beach amongst the rocks. Uh, corn, squash, of course, and I mentioned the apple orchards, and they would have had the berries and so on. Uh, the Totoket sachem. So again, every tribe had sort of a leader. Uh, the sachem here in, in Branford was Quasiquash, and he was the uncle of Mamogwin and Shampashu of Guilford. So you can see there were these blood relations and interactions. It was a community, just like we have our own communities here today. And then Quasiquash uh, was um, succeeded by Wampum. This is what the English called them their interpretation. And John Menta in his book, which I'll, I will talk about a little bit, uh, mentioned that he feels that the sachem wampum of the Totokets was the most important person as far as the colonial and Indian relationships. And the late John Menta, un unfortunately, uh, he died a pretty young age uh, of a brain tumor. It was such a horrible thing. He was a, f a friend of mine. But after his death, his sister and different colleagues put together his master thesis, which is the book, The Quinnipiac Qu Cultural Conflict in Southern New England. And that book is still being printed. It came out about 30 years ago. It's still being printed by Yale University Press. And so I'll just pass a couple of these around. And then I'll also, at the end, give you my, uh, my card with my email. If you want to buy it, I can send you the name of that title. Uh, if you have an interest, it's really superb research and an excellent book. And uh, we have in front of us, Martha's going to talk about them, the shells and the shellfish that the native people would have used extensively. And Ezra Stiles was the president of Yale, and in his notes, he says that the largest shell midden, and a midden, M-I-D-D-E-N, was this collection of shells that people left behind after they harvested the meat out of the shells. The largest shell midden he ever saw between Newport and New York City was in Brantford. I forget what he's, how high he said, but it's like 14, 15 feet high. And even when I was a kid in the woods in Short Beach before like the Brantford Hills condos got developed, uh, this is a sideline. We were like eight years old and our parents let us go up in the woods, you know, but we don't let that happen anymore. Uh, there were shell mittens up in the woods a mile in, mile and a half in from the shore. So the native people were everywhere, you know, all along the shore uh, taking in this bounty. Uh, they would have used the sea grasses for making their baskets. There was clay that they would have used for their pots. So they were very inventive and utilized everything that was here for their taking. Uh, they also, I mentioned, were farmers. They knew how to farm, they knew how to grow crops, and they would burn the land sometimes for uh, two to three acres at a time. And this had a multiple purposes. One, it helped the crops, it kept nutrients in the soil, uh, it kept the bugs away, and it also would help them to, to have some of the mammals come out of the fields so they could hunt. Brushy Plain is uh, by tradition named because that's a place where the Indians would burn the fields to make the plain. So the brush was burned, so it's called Brushy Plain. It's been called Brushy Plain since the colonists came. Uh, and they also did trees a little bit differently. They didn't cut the trees like we would cut a tree today. They would remove the bark, they would burn the tree, and then eventually the tree would die, but that was a slow process. And so the nutrients would go back into the soil and they would leave the trunk 
and plant their crops around it. And so those nutrients would continue. They knew how to do it. The colonists, they didn't have a clue. They decimated the fields and really sapped the, the energy out of the soil very quickly. I mentioned that. <laughs> Uh, and I think we already uh, mentioned the Shepherd's Point. The uh, two brothers, uh, Homer and Harvey Shepherd, were both Civil War veterans. They were natives of Brantford but lived in New Haven. And then you can see what a beautiful place this was. In 1967, I previously alluded to that the first ecclesiastical society to decide to not hold on to all this land that they had, uh, and they sold it to the Kilms for $126,000. We all should have pitched in together, folk people. Um, <laughs> but kept this end. What you're looking at off to my right is called House Island. It's always been called House Island because there's a house on it. It's one of my favorite spots. And even in the 38 hurricane, it withstood. That little tree has stood through everything. Isn't that amazing? There's an osprey nest on the top of that tree. Yeah. Yeah. The islands, oh, I'll just yeah. the islands here are called the Umbrella Islands. And the Brantford Land Trust owns those as well. And th there are a couple pictures where there's an umbrella tree. It's a little scrubby tree that will grow with salt water. And there used to be a couple umbrella trees on that island, and hence their names. Uh, I did bring, Martha's going to talk about her artifacts. I just did bring a couple artifacts um, to show you again. When I talk to children, I tell them how inventive not just the colonists were, but the natives, native people utilizing all these resources, including the rocks for making scrapers and bones for using hooks to, to, to catch fish and of course points, projectile points of all sizes to, to hunt and so on. So I'm going to pass those around. Please leave it in the Ziploc bag. And then also I'm, I'm going to hand around um, this thing that shows you the various tools and what they were called that the native uh, people used. And then lastly, oh, I'm uh, lastly, this is a, a pretty old picture of Shepherd's Point when the, with the cottages, the two cottages. Okay, good. Uh, so I went out this morning, and I wouldn't say these were artifacts because I collected them from the shore <laughs> this morning, but as Jane was saying, if, if you just picture this 600 years ago and all of the resources that were available this is one of the oyster shells that I found this morning. And this would have been a common food for the Native Americans. There are many other oyster shells here, but you'll see they're much smaller. And I can, I'm happy to pass these around if people are not familiar with the shellfish in the area. This is a clam or quahog. This was also readily available. And as probably most of you know, if you can see the inside, the uh, quahog is where wampum came from, where eventually the Native Americans used these for beads. They made necklaces. Here, I'll pass some of this around. Necklaces and belts and on headdresses. But later when the uh, colonists come, and I don't know if Jane has any information about this, the uh, the quahog was used, the color of the purple, was used for money. Um, we also have what we call oyster drills. They're teeny little shells. I'll pass them around. These were also used in belts and necklaces and headdresses. An oyster drill um, secretes a little um, liquid on top of an oyster that burns the oyster shell and then it sucks the meat out. Wow. Oyster drill. Yep. These are called whelks. These were also used, and you'll see in that picture, for um, they made beads out of the whelk. They also probably used these for food. They were very large snails. And there are steamer shells. This is a steamer shell. And we have two kinds of mussels. We have a ribbed mussel and a blue mussel. Now, 
blue mussels we don't see as much anymore. They um, are an indicator of water quality. They need a, a cleaner water quality. Um, they, are on, they are coming back. Uh, very edible, very unedible, but the Native Americans probably use these because they are plentiful uh, for bait. Crush them and use them for bait. What, what's unedible about them? Uh, the, ta the taste, I don't know, I've never, <laughs> I've never eaten one. But I, yeah. And then of course you have your fish, you have striped bass and bluefish. We also, there was a school of bunker right here a second of, ago. Um, and crabs. This is a blue crab shell. I found a couple of them this morning. Here's another one. No, these aren't blue, but they, they, do, <laughs> they do turn blue. <laughs> and then as Jane said, uh, birds and mammals. And it, come, feel free to come up and look at any of this this stuff. Um, I don't know if Jane wants to elaborate on. Yeah, no, I'll just, uh, it, it just crossed my mind that uh, we have a diary from the family that uh, owned Lanfair's Cove uh, and Double Beach, and they talk about multiple days a week going out and harvesting fish for bait or for fertilizer for their fields. Thousands of whitefish they caught at, in one outing with their boats. So the, these, these waters were just teeming with with fish of various kinds, small and large, with nets, with nets yeah, with nets. There's a narrow entrance here. If you fall in thin, you can probably make it through. And it goes off to the right, where it opens up, and there's a big opening at the top. Then there's also a narrow entrance at that end. You um, in there? When we, <laughs> she said, have you been in there? Not recently. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in those caves. Yes. And you don't want to be the first one of the day to go in there. A lot of spiders. Um, <clears throat> the kids love this place. The all the kids from camp come out here and make many, many, many rounds. When we first, uh, my family first moved to Killam's Point in the early 70s, um, there had been a gentleman, and I don't know his name, who had been out here looking for Indian artifacts and had found um, arrowheads inside the cave that are now, I believe, at the Peabody Museum. He took them to the Peabody, and I don't know what their origin is, which, which tribe they came from, but evidence that they were used as, shel as maybe shelter, um, but a very popular place for the kids. I will plant a... Uh, <laughs> I uh, will plant out the plants on top of the caves. We have wineberry, which you can see some of the red remaining berries that the birds or the kids haven't eaten. There is also a very, very healthy crop of poison ivy. So if you dare put your finger, your hands in there, be careful. And if you just listen for a minute, other than the plane, and imagine. They have, may remember uh, Alexander M Murphy, we knew him as Alex, and he was a wire, ri uh, petite man, thin, wiry, and he walked these woods constantly, and uh, he lived to about 95 years old. Um, and we were on a land trust walk one time, and we were here, my, my, mo <laughs> my mother was with me, and he just says, I'll be right back, and zip, he went down into the <laughs> cave, and my mo my mother was you know, just astounded. I mean, he was just a white. He knew every inch of these woods um, and, lo and loved them. Uh, so we had a very nice walk uh, out to Killam's Point. Uh, it's sponsored by the First Congregational Church of Brantford and the Brantford Land Trust. And a huge thank you to Jane Booley um, for coming out and, and sharing her expertise. Um, we have another event on Killam's Point that the church and the land trust is co-sponsoring in October. If you visit brantfordlandtrust.org, you can find more information about that. Thank you.